just to introduce myself then, I work for the National Trust in Wales as an archaeologist. Um, and sort of this, this morning, yeah, this morning, I kind of just wanted to introduce you to sort of the National Trust's perspective on coast in general, um, before I go into a couple of case studies about some things that have happened in Wales. So bear with me if I press the button. The presenter. Yes, so in Wales, there we are. Um, so almost a decade ago now, the National Trust uh, investigated how our coastline was likely to change over the next hundred years or so. And out of this, we came up with our Shifting Shores report, and that was back in 2005. Um, and it gave us one really clear message at the National Trust that we had to take on board, that as a nation, we didn't really feel uh, we could build our way out of trouble on the coast any longer. So if we fast forward... Uh, to the past few winters, it's really shocked us actually, sort of with a succession of violent storms, extreme tides and massive erosion all around the coast in Wales, as well as flooding. What we thought was going to happen in the next sort of five to 15 years is happening overnight. Um, so where in 2005, in our Shifting Shores report, we thought that 47 sites on the coast were going to be affected in the next 100 years or so. Um, I think it's become apparent to everyone that we have to seriously revise that figure now. Um, so increasingly, really, defence is the only form of sort of protection on the coast is something the National Trust has kind of thrown out of the window. And instead, our approach is really adapting with climate change and sort of letting the coastline do what it wants. Sort of today in Wales, um, the National Trust owns 25% of the coastline, so it's a huge area for us to be responsible for, and that's anything from sand dunes and salt marshes to villages, which are very much occupied now, um, and harbours and things like that. So through our Shifting Shores work, we work with a lot of partners, and we're putting into place policies and strategies and plans for what we want to do to manage that change on the coast. Um, and so most of that is adaptive. But we're clear, really, that sort of by re sort of throwing out the idea of sea defence, we're sort of freeing ourselves in the National Trust from the idea that sort of we've got to construct defences, those defences are going to fail, and we've got to construct more. We're very much accepting of the idea that the coastline is changing, and we have to work with that. Um, and also, we think that by not rebuilding all these hard structures on the coast, we're probably contributing to a more beautiful coastal environment, which I think is important. Um, but it does lead us to make some tough choices. Um, we can't store up these problems for the future. We have to deal with them now. Um, and I think probably the National Trust is sort of a multidisciplinary organisation in terms of conservation. It's probably often really on the front line of change that's affecting both the natural and the historic environment. Um, and really, I think the key for us is that partnerships are vital in order for us to be able to do what we want on the coast. Um, and currently we're working with a range of partners in sort of Wales and England and Northern Ireland um, to hopefully sort of deliver kind of some of what we want. Um, and I'd like to think that sort of the internal sort of policies that we've developed match those that some of you have, and um, that some of our sort of partners at Historic England, National Trust for Scotland, Historic Scotland, all have for the coast. Um, I kind of just wanted to run through some of the principles that the National Trust has developed internally, sort of our management of the coast, if that's okay. There's just 10, I'll go through them really quick. Um, so the National Trust internally, we've sort of accepted that the coast is dynamic and will change and we want to work with those processes. We want to take a long-term view and adapt, adopt a flexible management system for those changes. We want to plan for sort of sea level rise and realignment and sort of accommodate that wherever we can, whether it's reasonable, but without sort of flooding people's houses and villages that we look after, obviously. Um, we're only going to interfere with these natural processes where we feel there's a really strong social, cultural, economic reason. Um, and even if we do do that, it's only going to be like in a buying time kind of way. We don't want to stop that change. Again, I'm saying we really want to work with it. Apparently, we're going to take care of the natural environment too. So that's great. But most importantly for me, 
The National Trust made a really clear statement about value and cultural features in the coastal zone that will be conserved as far as possible. And most importantly, the National Trust has made a promise to itself that we are going to ensure those features are recorded properly where they are going to be lost. Um, because they're sort of important to us and they're important to our members and they're important to all of us. Um, we really want to also promote access and public sort of use of that coastal zone. That's one of the sort of factors that we work to. Um, we want to really be aware of any decisions that we make affecting things beyond our boundaries as well. I think that's quite significant in terms of what we're doing on the coast. Um, we're only really going to support development in the coastal zone where we think it's appropriate um, and where it's not going to have a detrimental effect on our neighbours or where it might not have a detrimental effect on us. And number 10, apparently the National Trust still going forward with the idea that if there's something under threat that we feel we can look after, we will consider acquiring it, which I think is, that's what we do, isn't it? Um, <laughs> But I suppose the big question is how can we fund any of that? Because it's all quite expensive. Um, I'd like to think that the National Trust is really good at promoting our cause um, and getting people to buy into that cause. And over the last 50 years or so, um, we've been really fortunate to be running, um, some of you may be aware of it, uh, it's a real great campaign called Neptune, um, which has been focused on the coast. Uh, and that campaign is able, sort of has had hundreds of thousands of people donate money, time and support so that we can ensure that we're looking after our coast. Um, in Wales, uh, Neptune, the Neptune Fund was used to purchase a piece of land on North Gower called Whitford Burrows, where there's lots of really exciting archaeology. And uh, that was back in 1965. And as recently as 2015, we've been able to use money from this Neptune fund to purchase uh, a piece of land in North Wales called the Great Orm. And again, lots of really significant archaeology there. So, you know, we're only 25% of the Welsh coastline. As I said, that's a lot of land and that's a lot of archaeology. Um, so we are continuing with that campaign to try and raise funds to carry out and continue to do the work we want on our, on our coast. And I think, really, the thing that the National Trust is good at is making our messages clear, I would like to hope anyway. Um, and I think if you want to engage the public in what you're doing, you need to tell them what, what you are doing, how you're going to do it, how you want them to help you do it, um, why it, it's important that it should be done, um, and how much something costs. For example, did you know Apparently, it takes an average of £3,000 a year to look after one mile of the Welsh coastline. Bob from Trident Trek told me that. Um, but really, most importantly, you have to ask people to support your cause. You really do. You can't expect people to know what you're doing unless you ask them to sort of engage with you. Um, in Wales, we're quite unique in Britain in that we have a coast, a continual coast path. Um, People in Wales go to the seaside, the beach, to relax, to play, to connect with the cultural and the natural environment. Um, and days at the, the seaside and walks along coastal cliffs are really important to that kind of collective memory. And we need to make sure we cherish that coast. Um, one sort of note, though, is that, interesting, although the coast path is a great resource, it's worth noting that it does need constant maintenance. Um, within the first six months of opening, that sort of all Wales coast path had actually disappeared due to erosion um, in Ceredigion. So, I think perhaps one of the difficulties though, that all the great work that the National Trust does, one of the difficulties I have as an archaeologist in the National Trust is getting us to focus from that broader conservation vision down into a very specific area into archaeology. It, it's it's quite a challenge sometimes. And I imagine that you know, colleagues with different specialisms would have a, a similar issue. So at this point, I just want to talk briefly, really briefly, about a, a case study. Um, so in Wales, um, the National Trust were a partner in uh, the Arvadir Coastal Archaeology Project, which you can see in the screen grab from there. And uh, 
just really briefly to explain that in Wales, Arvadir was a pan Wales project funded through grant aid and administered by the Welsh Archaeological Trusts. Um, and that grant aid coming from CADU, so essentially from Welsh Government. Uh, the purpose of the project was to gather records of coastal archaeological sites, um, and especially those under threat of loss whilst working with the community. Um, today, I'm just going to focus a little bit on the project as it was carried out in South East Wales, um, sort of which folks from the Gower all the way around to the Vale of Glamorgan, if you've ever been there. Um, largely because this area is under probably most threat of not only development but of coastal sort of change due to climate change um, and also because it largely overlaps with National Trust properties that I work on in South, South Wales there so it's good, good for me um, just to give you an idea of where we are as you'll see now um, I've just got a few images from the various years and a few statistics for you for the Arvadir project it was a four year project year one as you can see, lots of interested, happy people. Uh, and year one of the project, just to give you a few statistics, was actually a really great success, I think. Um, 254 people were actively engaged in the first year of the project. They recorded 125 new sites and added that information to the historic environment record. But further than that, they actually shared that information with us as landowners at the National Trust and other partners for us to use. Um, and eight sites we already knew about had their records updated because they had changed. So moving on to year two of the project, 222 people actively involved, 63 new sites on that coastal zone recorded and added to the record, and another eight known sites having their records updated. Year three, more happy people, uh, 125 people actively engaged in archaeology on the coast at this point. 47 new sites recorded and added to the historic environment record. Again, those records shared with us at the National Trust so we could do something about some of the stuff that you're identifying in that project. And 16 known sites updated. Year four of the project. Unfortunately, at this point, I don't have any statistics about the number of people actively involved. Um, we do know that, that sort of that was the end of the funding for the project. So I think it's probably part of that natural life cycle of the project that really it was coming to an end and focusing really on trying to develop solutions of how to carry it forward so we're missing some data there. Um, I guess the thing really I want to say now is, is sort of coming on to some examples of where I now as this project has obviously ended in Wales um, in terms of funding uh, but I'm still experiencing sort of the outcomes of that project so I'm under pressure in my role uh, as I'm seeing an increase in reports from our members, members of the public, just people on the coast sort of wanting to report that change and the pattern of work that they've got in, used to but who are they reporting it to? Are they reporting it to me now? Which is great but is, is putting a lot of pressure on me. So I just want to give you a few examples. Um, this is Kyber Bay Lime Kiln in Keradigian, one of our properties in the National Trust. I'd never been there because it was kind of right out on the edge of the patch that I work in. And this loss was reported to us uh, by a former Arvadir volunteer. And the pressure that I faced there, you know, the, the, the members of the public who had been involved in Arvadir, they knew what it was, they knew it was significant, and they wanted us at the National Trust to do something about it because they valued it and didn't want it to be lost. Okay, so another example, Rasili on Gower. I'll just take you a few images. That's an Arvadir volunteer after the end of the project reporting to me at the National Trust coastal slip um, where we know there to be a medieval village. So this volunteer knows about the archaeology that's on the coast and is coming and talking to me saying, well you're the archaeologist for the National Trust, I've got to report it to someone, can you do something about it? That has now led to a further piece of work that's going to be going ahead in September where we're going to be doing survey work and possibly some investigation to try and understand the extent of the loss of the medieval village there, which has been funded through the Neptune funds. So another example, I apologise for the quality of the photographs here. Uh, this is Aber Ivy in Pembrokeshire, where you've got an old slate quarry, which is well used. You can see some 
quarry workers' houses, and then these are really bad grainy images. But to demonstrate, 2009 where the coast was, 2012, 13, 13 again, and now last winter, where you can see those, can you see those quarry workers' houses right on the edge now of the sea? Um, again, this is a site owned by the National Trust. I was aware that there was coastal loss here and that there's a series of peaks on the sort of shore that had been scoured away but had been recorded by other dear volunteers. But now, the challenge that I faced was convincing my colleagues at the National Trust, who aren't archaeologists or curators, that actually we should really record these quarry cottages before they're lost. I don't say we should keep them, but we should certainly record them. And I was able to convince them to do that because the former volunteer volunteers working in that area were applying so much pressure locally for that work to be done, we had to spend the money there. Another example, uh, Consilio in Keredigan, where a chance find on New Year, January this year, New Year's Day, um, a guy had gone for a walk and he found what he thought was some human remains poking out of the cliff. Um, and he had been involved in our idea. Uh, reported it to the police, they reported it to the local archaeological trust, who then spoke to us as the landowners. We were able to find some money, again through Neptune, to pay for this work to be done on the coast to remove those human remains before they were lost and to record the rest of the archaeology there. And this this massive group of people, we were down there in March, and all the people who were walking along the coast, nothing to do with us, just stopped and wanted to know what we were doing. And it was actually really a great day, as you can see. And these archaeologists come from David Archaeological Trust, who were also involved in the archaeological Arvadir project. Um, another one where Arvadir volunteers, had they still been in existence, might have made my life easier at the National Trust, is a place called Cum Ivy, or North Gow. It's a marshland. It was a reclaimed marshland, um, but in line with the policies that the National Trust have to allow coastal realignment and to provide compensatory habitats for loss, elsewhere. This whole marshland um, doesn't look very medieval, but it was a medieval sea wall, I can promise you that, um, was allowed to be breached um, because we're not stopping things from changing on the coast. And you can see sort of dramatic change and loss and serious change with the tide coming in now. So that whole former reclaimed landscape, it was, which was also listed as a registered historic landscape, so should be protected to a degree, is now lost and changed. That's been quite a difficult project for me because we've been working with natural environment colleagues who are providing compensatory habitat now, um, but we're also losing parts of the historic environment. So had the Arbadir volunteers been there, I think it might have made that journey a bit easier in terms of sort of helping react and sort of talk to the local community because I think they felt quite cut off from the process and it's my understanding that on that part of North Gower there was quite an active group locally within the community and I think they felt that actually the National Trust made a bit of a mistake on that one because we didn't communicate with them effectively about the change that was happening. So I guess really my key point is that the National Trust and you know government in Wales, all of us, have got all these great policies for the coast, you know, we've got protections, designations, individually protected monuments and all that kind of stuff, but how those then get translated into action on the ground is really the, the issue and the problem that I, I face. And whilst it was running, Arvaldia was a conduit for that. It was the means by which the policies that we're all supposed to be working to could actually be translated into action. Um, and really, without this project running in Wales, I'm facing a challenge as National Trust archaeologist to deliver on the expectations of an archaeologically aware public. Um, I'd just like to thank as well, before I finish, Ellie Graham and Andy Sherman, who both contributed their knowledge of the Arvdeer project to my presentation today, so thank you both.